If you're an Ayurvedic practitioner or healer of any kind, I think that this video will have something for you. Last week I spoke to a dear friend of mine who's been an Ayurvedic practitioner for, well, way before we in the West even knew what the term meant. I wanted to speak to her about painkillers, but we didn't quite get round to it and we had some technical issues as you'll see in the recording, but I, I salvaged what I could because the information was, was golden and I really wanted to share it with you all. Angela Hope Murray has many strings to her bow, including osteopathy, podiatry, Ayurvedic acupuncture, and she specializes in nutrition and musculoskeletal conditions. In my opinion, I think we can all benefit from what Angela has to say, so listen up and take what you need. I hope you find it useful, and if you do, please consider subscribing for more of the same. Thanks for tuning in. Bye for now. Hello, Angela, and thank you for doing this with me. It's so nice to see you after a really long time. It's my pleasure, Natasha. I have deep respect for your work, and <clears throat> it's an honour to be able to speak to you. The, the honour is mine, really. Um, and there are so many things that we could talk about today, and however this pans out, what's in the forefront for me these days is the subject of painkillers and other medication that is taken for quick fixes, so maybe we can touch on that at some point. <clears throat> but before that, let's talk about you. In the 80s, Ayurveda was not a common subject, um, especially on this side of the world. And So how did you get into it? Well, I was living in Boston, Massachusetts, because my husband was a techie, and I was taken there fortuitously. Uh, I'd been working in the NHS and I was very happy in the NHS actually and I had an existential crisis when I arrived in America uh, and realized that I actually had nothing to do because I didn't have the L1 visa which is the one that you can work with and I had the L2 visa which meant that I can accompany somebody who's working there. So it was a seed change in my career and I decided to do a master's degree in nutrition and health counselling. And one of my internships was in the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital in Boston where I met, met Ted Kapchuk who was um, the author of The Web That Has No Weaver. Many people in actually know him and he was quite a visionary and inspiring really. And in the occasional lunchtime meetings, I met Dr. Vasant Ladd. And it was a crossroads in my life because I'd just been initiated in the Advaita Vedanta tradition a month before. And then hearing Dr. Ladd speak, and he'd only just been sent to America by his guru, who was a farmer in Pune. And he his farmer, Guru said, you go to um, America and spread the news about Ayurvedic medicine. So he arrived in 83 and I met him at the beginning of 86. And so I thought, I've got to learn this because it seems so sensible to me. It's about body, mind and spirit. And I'd been at that point trained in podiatry where you only could look at the body in terms of the foot the leg to the knee and I always asked even when I was 18 training at the London Foot Hospital how come we're missing out the rest of the body because surely it has a huge impact on what's going on in the lower limb anyway so this was had had to be learned there was nowhere to learn it and then I very fortunately met this lady who had the Alston Ayurvedic Center. She was what's called a physical therapist in America. And she used to have a, a, a big friendship with Dr. Ladd. And he would come and every month spend a week with us in her clinic. And we'd be looking at patients and learning Ayurveda with him. 
So I was really lucky. And the same time I met Robert Svoboda when he just qualified. So he just qualified in India and he came back to living in, in America. And he also knew this lady who's the physical therapist, whose name I can't remember at the moment. But anyway, um, so they, it was a great fortune for me. And... Um, there was no formal training. Uh, by the time I came back to England in 1989 and I started at the Hale Clinic, I met people from the School of Philosophy in London who were involved in medical care and they also wanted some sort of formal training in Ayurveda. And our dream came true, one in 95 when we were at the um, Iqbalberry Yoga Center, which was a yoga center dealing with multiple sclerosis, and um, the, the 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 few people there were about ten of us um, were sitting in a meeting uh, with Dr. Ladd, and then Maru Fatik, Dr. Maru Fatik, pitched up out of nowhere, came to the meeting, and said to Dr. Ladd. I've got a PhD in um, uh, nursing and I'm also an education and I'm also an Ayurvedic physician from Sri Lanka. So we all went, oh, yippee, this is going to happen. We are going to create a formal school. So the formal school was formed and we started in St. Mary's Hospital in 95. I think we had about 20 students. And it was a three-year course, and the College of Ayurveda was set up. And that slowly evolved because of Dr. Atik, who I am eternally grateful to, really, because he put the legwork in to get this ratified as a course. And we started um, a master's degree and a BSc degree in Ayurvedic medicine at Middlesex University. And that happened about um, 2000 or 1999. So we formally... Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my video just fizzed out, but it's come back again. Um, and so that was also fortuitous because I was there on the first course that ever happened at Middlesex. They also had a course in uh, Western Herbal Medicine and one in Acupuncture. And then years later, I think it was like the year 2000, no, it must have been about nine or ten years later, uh, I was at the, the, the last day of the course. So, um, the college, the university couldn't afford to keep those three courses on because there wasn't enough intake. I'm sure if they did it now, it might actually be financially viable for the university. So, yeah, no, that, that's the journey. <laughs> um, the trainings now have become massively diluted in, in the sense of most of the people that are coming out of these courses, especially the ones online, have no clinical experience whatsoever. And that is the most important part, really, is the application of the wisdom. Uh, it's not complete until one has actually seen it working in the corporeal world with pa real patients and real people. Yes, I, I mean it, it's also it's also a healing journey of one's own. I mean it's forty years now, and I suppose you're still learning today. Yes, yeah. but like many Indian Indian, go ahead. No, you were saying like many Indian. No, I was just saying like many Indian Indian disciplines. Uh, it's you know, it's actually a way of life passed down through generations. So physicians are learning from their their uh, their father or their uncle uh, from from their early childhood. Um, 
Yeah. And also because of this, the discipline, I suppose I'm just going to take a little bit of a detour, is it incorporates various aspects of family life, such as rituals and chanting and Vedic astrology. And yeah. was was, uh, was Dr. Ladd teaching that? He must have been teaching that back then also. He was. He was. He always um, taught us to look at people's charts, look at their jyotish, um, see where Saturn is. And I always noted in my own um, intake, when a patient comes to see you, there's usually an affliction of Saturn. And it's learning to manage the effects of Saturn in our lives because the, Saturn brings karmic experience. Um, and it's learning how to play your part well during what can be quite restrictive times when Saturn <laughs> is active. <laughs> but you were just saying something just now about what Saturn's up to today, November the 22nd, 2024. Yep. It's stationed... Um, it's 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 moving forward again but very slowly um so it's in a uh, conjunction with mars which it causes a lot of restrictions the charaka samhita is should we say the bible of uh ayurveda in a way charaka is the tome for um general medicine shushruta is the uh, tome that we use for more surgical procedures and panchakarma techniques. And then there's somebody called Vagbahata who wrote a, a major text in about the 12th century. So all those books are the main um, thrust of Ayurvedic medicine. Right. And um, so... I'm, I'm sure you've studied them in some detail. And what could you tell us uh, of the aspirations of a good physician, according to the texts? The good physician can listen because the ultimate vajja can hear everything about a person. So if the, if the, the good vajja is practising themselves, a period of at least an hour a day of meditation, two periods during the, the time of dawn and dusk, will refine the listening. And in the listening, one can know everything that is needed for the patient. And sometimes it is to actually let the patient die, uh, not to obstruct the passage of the patient. And I remember when I was at the Shattuck Hospital, we had a patient and the Dalai Lama's doctor came to uh, look at the patient. He had lead poisoning. He was a spray painter on a, uh, a in a vehicle factory, lead paint. And um, he took his pulse and straight away, he was a very quiet man. He could hear the pulse, which means the Nadi, the river of life. And he said that this disease is karmic and we can't do anything to help him other than you know the more esoteric things like buddha vidya and just um facilitating the psychological side of this fellow's life uh, into acceptance um in in the best way possible it's not always helpful to get in the way, but to help the patient understand past actions and where they've led. I didn't know that the, 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 the role of the physician was to be a good listener. That's very interesting because, um, as you know, sound is the, the, the finest of the elements. I mean, finest of the perceptions which yes. then is the bridge between the manifest and the unmanifest. So in order to be able to listen Definitely. so well, uh, you're really placing yourself uh, at, that, at the doorway between both worlds. 
exactly exactly the primacy of sound in this creation is very relevant to all of us and you can hear the three doshas you know with a practice ear as soon as a person enters the room and you're counseling them you can hear vatipitra or kapha you can hear in a, the brokenness of a person you know the dried up cracked voice you can tell that that person's had a lot of stress and vata is very evident at the same time you can hear somebody who's got hypertension and gastritis and amala pitta or the heart diseases because they're speaking like this in an extremely commanding and sharp all the qualities of pitta by the same token you can hear the dullness and the heaviness of kapha and the slow soft slimy voice you can hear it so you're already if you're really listening you've already got a great gateway as you well use that word to understanding that soul that's there in front of you and we have to always remember that we're sharing the same soul we are the paramatman manif made manif manifest in jiva atman which is our individual soul so the listening beyond compare beyond compare that's beautiful angela thank you for that um do you also do you also uh take the pulse of your patients i do i do yes is that more of a secondary thing if you've already found yeah number one is that and of course you're looking at the dimensions of the person whether they're tall and lanky <laughs> tiny and uh, red hair you know all those characteristics that are part of the doshic information uh, and then you take the pulse but it's always good to more or less you know sit that let the patient sit there talk a little bit about why they're there and then that you can read the pulse because they trust you because it, you're entering that person's space and like eisenberg's uncertainty principle says the observer affects the observed so if you're putting the patient at rest and they trust and they're open to you the minute you put your fingers on their pulse you can receive the message and again it arises in out of stillness so you also get a clear reading by then yeah you get a clearer reading and knowledge arises knowledge arises in a quiet mind sometimes you get things and you think my <laughs> it's like you get things and you think i didn't think that it didn't come through any rational channel in my head but it came through something in my heart a kind of knowledge and if you have positive regard for that person who's sitting opposite you and know that behind that presentation of the hahankara there's the one that you're sharing in fact they're you <laughs> so they're a mirror <laughs> and so the more open one can stay in that place of understanding the better the um treatment will be and you need your meditation practice in order to be able to be in the present moment to be able to be awake to those messages yeah it it's fueled my life really i was initiated when i was 29 which is the saturn return it's if you think of a vortex you started at birth and you know this that you've gone round the whole of the zodiac till you've reached the age of 29 28 and a half 29 2 and a half year period so you're looking down at what from whence you've came 
and the Vedas chose to come to, back to me because I'm sure in a past existence I was familiar with this teaching. Also, the ancient Egyptians. And I've got Hatta on here. Hatta, she's the goddess of love. She was the progenitor of Venus in the Greek pantheon and Aphrodite. Actually, Venus is Roman, but Aphrodite is the Greek one. My friend who died, who was a Jungian analyst, left me Hatta. And she's got the cow's horns of the moon. She's a cow. <laughs> is she also the one with the very big ears? Yes. For listening? Yes. Yes. She's listening. All right. And it's amazing that the, in India, all cultures had the idea of a cow being sacred. Because they're so loving. Uh, the other thing that I, I, I remember that Charika says about a physician, they should know about everything. And unless you've got somebody who's really interested in the world, the more one's imbued with the spirit of the plant world, nature, they're so often people they know their formula but then they they don't know what it looks they don't know what ashwagandha looks like they haven't smelt the earth in their own back garden <laughs> um so i think it, it Cherik is right you have to actually be interested in the world around you in every aspect so that helps very much to connect with the person sitting in front of you. You know, if somebody says to you, well, I was born in Uzbekistan and then I can eat, or, uh, well, I would say, well, I've been there too. <laughs> or, you know, tell me about it, uh, if that's relevant to their experience. So you have to be interested in everything. You can't cut things out that you think aren't, relevant to where you want to go to get the information that you need. That makes complete sense. I mean, it's the micro and the macro. The one is in the other and the other is in the other one. They're all reflections, like you said. Yes. Well, I know you know. <laughs> I know you know that. I know you know that. You also work with the mama puncture. As I'd never heard it called that before, uh, but mama therapy, mama puncture, um, which is very similar to, uh, to acupuncture, but slightly different. It is. It is. Yes, well, the origins are very fascinating. Um, if you go to, um, I forgot his name now, Jaya... Uh, Jayasuri, uh, book on acupuncture, you'll see a picture on the first page of an elephant and it's got Sri Lankan Pali script on it where the different points are on an elephant and how the Mahout used his little stick to train the, 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 the elephant from the east on how to bend down and do work and carry princes on their backs so this idea of mama was promulgated according to uh, the Indian tradition well before the Chinese knew about acupuncture so they say that there was a place called Barangoda in, in Ceylon which was um, about three th and a half thousand, four thousand years ago, it was called the land of the giants. And in caves, they found these little chert uh, pieces of stone which are carved into a point, and these points were used to penetrate points in people's bodies. Mm. Now, what they've found r recently is that the spice root was actually older than the silk root. So how do they know this? They know this from something called the Ebrus papyri, which is in the British Museum. 
And in it, they looked at uh, sarcophagi of ancient Egypt, Egyptians. And one of the preservation herbs they used was pipali. And at that point in time, only Sri Lanka and India were growing pipali. So they knew that to get to sail from uh, Tamil Nadu to India via uh, to Egypt via the Saudi Arabia was a very, very common affair. The Egyptian, Indian, Sri Lankan trade was much more um, established as a route than anything that the Chinese did. Now, the Chinese monks bought to Taxila University from China um, the the idea of uh, Tong diagnosis that was definitely taken from the Chinese, but the a lot of Indians, it's called Sushi Veda, would argue that the Chinese actually used the model of penetration of the skin from India and took it to China. Now, if you say that in the school of just down the road here, they're not very happy. But in a way, I think it's irrelevant. It, it's obvious, isn't it, that even if you look at Otsai Man, the guy who was frozen on the um, at the Dolomites on his trail between Austria, which wasn't Austria in the Bronze Age, probably four or five five thousand years ago, he was crossing and he was murdered because they found an, an arrow in his back. And he was frozen. And what they noticed when they examined his body, which you can see in a museum now in, in northern Italy, is he's got tattoos on the parts of his body which are related to sciatic pain. And um, he actually had fusion of his lumbar vertebra. And so they've assumed that in Otsai Man, he was also aware of pressing certain points in the body to inst instigate certain reactions, to inst instigate certain reactions. Incredible. So I think, yeah, I think we're all sitting around for hours on end with each other. We're much more social in times gone by. And people must have pressed and touched each other and thought, yeah, actually, that makes me feel a hell of a lot better when you press there, uh, especially on the head. Um, there are specific points where you can, you know, straight away sense that when you've got any headache, help. I mean, one of those is Adipati Mama. Hmm. And you probably know where that is. Um, <clears throat> in the ground chakra, yeah, you put your palm here, the extend your middle finger to the, this point. That's Adi Pati. Adi means great, Pati means father. It's the great father of all the points. So, because that's the great father, any situation, nervousness, confusion, pain is going to be helped by massaging that point and can somebody do that for themselves of course of course all those points on your body in chinese medicine there's no i don't think there's a sanskrit um word for it is the do you know what the hashi points are no, hashi i haven't heard of them no Right, well, harsh points is where we get the word ha, she, like that, is where it, you press something and it really hurts you. So for any person, pressing the harsh she points is really helpful in management of pain, suffering anywhere else in the body. So it's worth feeling about unless you've got a frank bruise or you've sprained your ankle or something really hurts or you've got some sort of inflammatory disease like um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is a systemic disease of heat and 
toxins in the system and you're like inflamed everywhere. It's going to help, but uh, the Hashi points are different. They're more like you you, uh, you feel okay, but you press a certain point on the body and you think, oh, my gosh, that's painful. Just rub it until you feel. You can do it on your own hands. Mm -hmm. You know, press this round around you know the, the 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 proximal phalanx on the inside is related to your neck mm -hmm. so this is really quite a helpful place to massage on the internal angle of the proximal phalanx so you know just is that the point that they they say to massage if you have a headache or is that a different point yeah, no, that leads into between the metacarpals, the first metacarpal and, and the, the second metacarpal at its junction here, there, is um, the point that is connected to, to uh, pain, actually. It's vata. It's the main, one of the main vata points in the body. So vata, as we know, the main store of vata, main store of vata is in the pelvis and um, any pain, pain is always associated with vata dosha. So this point, as you well point out, is good for headaches. What would you say, Angela, because I'm just, um, I'm, I'm watching the time and I just want to get a few points in. <clears throat> what would you say is the most profound observation you've discovered working with people's bodies, your personal discovery? That is, <laughs> oh my goodness. That's, that's a difficult question. Oh, sorry, Angela. <laughs> I think the discovery that I no, no, but I think one of the most profound discoveries, I mean, I always dedicate to Dumbuntary before I see anybody. I've got, a, I've got my shed in the garden and I've got a statue of Dumbuntary. I'll show Dumbuntary here. Dana means bow and Antari means the bow that kills disease. Okay. Uh, he's the 13th incarnation of Vishnu. So I always do a little ceremony before I speak, start work. And I try to remember, and often it can happen to me, that you are, a, that I'm a tool of the absolute. And try to take out my ego. Um, I think over the years, I have realized that I am a tool of the absolute. And something you were saying earlier, because really, our life is a moment to moment journey to the divine. So we have to realize that we, our ego is not the divine. And of course, years and years ago, when I was in a group, you know, you always want to be the best. It's yours. It's yours. So there's a refinement going on within my own soul. It's not my soul. It's the soul. <laughs> and my, 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 my realization that it's, it's there. And um, not claiming that any success is mine. I mean, it's an aspiration. But I've got better and better at it you know and if people don't come or they're late or something like that happens my greatest goal is that i'm not attached to it anymore i just think that's the way it is and it's not it doesn't require any pressure to keep things out of the way it's just okay that's the way it is i can't do something for this person I don't claim that. And then when I can do something for the person as a tool of the absolute. Sorry, I lost you there a little bit. Um, I really want to just talk a little bit about the connection between 
um, the connection between gut health and the body and the mind. How important is gut health? Gut health has primacy in Ayurveda. You are a hollow tube beginning in the mouth and ending in the rectum. And without health of that along that whole alimentary tract, nothing will ever work well or correctly in the system. So how we metabolize what we eat, how we metabolize it, and how we refine it into chyle and move it into um, lymph, and then its little journey through the different types of cells in the body, unless it's as pure and the fires are burning as within the system, which is the enzyme system, then problems will arise with toxins forming. Uh, you said the mind, which is really right on, because you obviously really do understand body, mind and spirit. And what we expose ourselves to in terms of mass media and dark forces, really, should be limited in every way possible. Um, and when we you need say beauty dark forces, in our lives. We should mean? always... What do you mean? Dark forces. Well, yesterday I went to... <laughs> Soho <laughs> and I was at the Gilgood Theatre which is I think it's just changed its name to something else um, in Shaftesbury Avenue and it was 10 o'clock at night and the lights are all flashing away and all these people eating spicy foods and takeaway meals at 11 o'clock at night because that's when we moved to get back to our car which was parked miles out of London um, and the temptations that were being offered in the form of striptease